Video Lecture 9A, Bonding a la Lewis, Ions and Ionic Bonding. So far in our general chemistry adventures, we've encountered a variety of ionic and molecular compounds and have studied some of their reactions. In Chapter 2, we've also seen that we could predict the type of ion that a main group element will form based on its group. However, we've only been able to do this by memorization. However, in the last two chapters, we've seen that there's some con connectivity between the position of a group and its electron structure. We've noticed that elements within the same groups have very similar electron configurations for their valence electrons. And this causes them to have very similar reactivity. In chapter 9, we will take this further and discuss a very simple way to explain why atoms combine to form compounds. From our observations, we've, must, we've noticed that noble gases tend to not form compounds with one, with one another or with other atoms in the periodic table. This was also noticed by Gilbert Lewis in 1916 and led him to postulate that atoms are most stable when they are isoelectronic or have the same electron configuration as noble gases. Therefore, main group atoms in particular will interact with one another to achieve noble gas configurations. This rule is simply known as the noble gas rule, but it's also known by another name. We saw in chapter 8 that, most, that all noble gases have eight valence electrons. Therefore, the noble gas rule is also known as the octet rule. Since the noted exception to this is helium, which has the two valence electrons. There are two ways in which atoms can obtain noble gas electron configurations electron transfer, and electron sharing. In this lecture, we will focus on electron transfer. The noble gas rule is a very powerful predictive tool that is still used today in, in chemistry classes, as well as in general chemistry and advanced chemistry classes as well. However, it's important to note that Lewis came up with his noble gas rule about 10 years before quantum mechanics was developed. Therefore, he had no knowledge of orbitals and could not write electron configurations for atoms. He preferred to think of atoms as tiny cubes, which each, with each vertice of the cube holding one electron. Therefore, a whole atom could hold up to eight electrons in its outermost shell. He based his model very loosely on the Bohr model. This allowed Lewis to very simply diagram atoms by using dot structures. In his dot structures, he represented the valence electrons as tiny dots surrounding the atomic symbol for a given atom. If you think of surrounding your atomic symbol with a square, two electrons can be placed around each side of the square, allowing each dot structure to hold eight electrons. This very easily represents the valence shell for all of our main group elements. In the table on the right, there are, we, we show representative Lewis structures for each group. Notice that electrons are typically placed around the atoms to represent the normal valence or the normal number of bonds that each atom can form. For example, carbon is in group 4A. Most elements in group 4A tend to form four 
covalent bonds with other non-metal atoms. Therefore, four dots are placed around the carbon atoms to signify the places where carbon can form these covalent bonds. We will look more at Lewis dot structures as we learn to draw them from molecules. As mentioned before, the simple one way that a noble atoms can obtain a noble gas electron configuration is through electron transfer. This tends to happen between metals and nonmetals. We know that metals tend to form cations or tend to lose electrons. They can lose these electrons to nonmetals, which typically have high electron affinities. Noble gas electron configurations can be, can be obtained for all of the nonmetals, as well as main group metals and select transition metals. In class, we will, I will show a demonstration of the formation of sodium chloride from scratch. In other words, we will make sodium chloride from sodium metal and chlorine gas. In this demonstration, we will need to heat up the sodium metal so that the sodium atoms can enter into the gas phase in order to react with chloride, chlorine atoms. We know, we know from chapter two that sodium, which is in group 1A, tends to form a plus one cation, while chlorine, which is in group 7A, tends to form a minus one anion. We know these facts simply by memorization. However, we will now see why this is so. Let's look at the electron configurations for the atoms and the ions that they form. The sodium atom has a single valence electron in a 3S subshell. When sodium loses its, this electron, it has the same electron configuration or is isoelectronic with the neon atom, an energetically stable electron configuration. Chlorine, on the other hand, has seven valence electrons, two in its 3s subshell and five in its 3p subshell. It needs one more electron, which it can obtain through from the sodium atom to achieve a noble gas electron configuration. When it gains this electron, it has a, it has a full 3p subshell. This makes the chloride ion isoelectronic with argon. Note that both of our ions, the sodium ion and the chloride ion, both have noble gas electron configurations, which are especially energetically stable. This helps to explain the stoichiometry of combination for the sodium chloride. We can fully describe the energetics of, ion of the formation of ionic bonds in crystal lattices using the Born-Haber cycle. We won't describe this here, however, we will discuss some main aspects. As mentioned in the previous slide, both the sodium and chloride chlorine atoms need to be in the gas phase to, to react. Electron transfer will occur between the metal and nonmetal atoms when their total potential energy equals the difference between the ionization energy of the metal and the electron affinity of the nonmetal. When, this, when the electron transfer occurs, the resulting atoms, the resulting ions will attract one another since they have op, equal and opposite charges. 
This attraction occurs, bringing the ions closest to, closer together until they reach an equilibrium distance. As the ions attract one another, the potential energy, the total potential energy of the ions decreases. This decrease in energy results in an ionic bond. Therefore, the forces that hold ionic compounds together are Coulomb attraction. It results from the Coulombic attraction, the attraction between two char oppositely charged ions. When atoms form, form ions, the, their radius changes. Cations tend to have smaller radii than their parent atoms. The chart to the, we've seen the chart to the right before when talking about atomic radii. But now we will look at the dashed circles. If you look at all of the metals, which are further to the left, you will see that the small dash circle indicates how the size of the cation changes as they lose electrons. All cations have smaller radii than their parent atoms. Since the loss of a valence electron increases the effective, nucle the effective nuclear charge, which allows the electron cloud to be pulled in closer to the nucleus of the atom. Anions, by contrast, have larger radii than their parent atoms, as seen in the chart on the right. The extra electron is repelled by the other electrons, and the effective nuclear charge decreases. The extra electron in particular is held less tightly to the nucleus, and this, and this causes the electron cloud to increase in size. We see a special trend when looking at isoelectronic ions. We see this trend on the right. All the ions on the right are isoelectronic with neon. We see that as the atomic number increases between nitrogen and aluminum, the ionic radius in will be also de will decrease. This is due to the increase in effective nuclear charge as Z increases, which causes the electron cloud to be drawn closer to the nucleus, decreasing the size of the ion. So far, we've only discussed cation formation for main group metals. It is very easy to predict to predict the electron configuration for main group metals, since they tend to be isoelectronic with noble gases. However, for the d-block metals or transition metals, this isn't always the case. Transition metals don't always form cations that are isoelectronic with noble gases. Therefore, we need to look at other factors in writing their electron configurations. When transition metals undergo ionization, their ns electrons are ionized before their n-1d electrons. This is contrary to what we saw in the off-ball principle, where we saw that the n-1d electrons are filled after the ns electrons. So why are they ionized in the opposite order? There are several factors that contribute to this, but one simple fact is that the NS electrons are on average further away from the nucleus. We can see this by examining the radial distribution functions for, the, for NS orbitals versus the N minus one orbitals. This shows that NS electrons are more likely to be further away from the nucleus, although they are lower in energy. This combined with other factors 
allow for the ns electrons to be ionized before the n minus 1d electrons. Therefore, when we write electron configurations for transition metals, we should remove electrons with the highest n first, then remove electrons from subsequent d um, subshells. The pictures on the right show the different ions that the vanadium atom can form, which range between the vanadium 2 plus ion and the vanadium 5 plus ion. These ions have different colors in solution. Suppose we wanted to write the electron configuration for the vanadium 2 plus ion. To do this, we should write the electron configuration for the neutral atom and remove the appropriate electrons. The electron configuration for vanadium is argon 4s2 3d3. To write the electron configuration for vanadium 2 plus, we will remove the 4s electrons, since on average they are further away from the nucleus and are most likely to be ionized. Therefore, the electron configuration for the vanadium 2 plus ion is argon 3d3.